So for this section, we have a couple of definitions that we need to start introducing some ideas. So the first is the theorem 3.1.2. This states that if y1, y2, y3, y4, all the way up to yk are solutions of the homogeneous nth order de, where you have a function in, front, in terms of x times the nth derivative, a function in terms of x times the n minus one derivative all the way down to a function times the third derivative of a function of x times the second derivative, a function of x times the first derivative, a function of x times y equal to zero. Therefore, this is also a linear e equation as well by definition. Then the linear combination. Now linear combination just means coefficients and added, um, and terms that are added together. So a linear combination would be when I add, subtract, multiply, or divide. Um, actually, when you multiply or divide by a constant, and when you add or subtract the two functions together. So you see how here you end up with c1, y1, c2, y2, c3, y3, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and the c's are all arbitrary constants, okay? Um, so it's saying that if these individual guys are solutions to the DE, then the linear combination of them is also a solution to the DE. That's what that theorem is stating. The second thing we have here is a definition 3.1.1, which is linear dependence or linear independence. So these functions, y1, y2, y3, y4, so on, can be written as f1, f2, f3, so on and so forth, okay? And these functions are dependent if you can write them as a linear combination um, that equals zero for all x, okay? Um, now remember, c can be anything, but not all the c values can equal zero, okay? So you could have most of them equal to zero, but not all of them. Now it's said to be linearly independent if functions, um, if you cannot write one function in terms of a linear combination of the other functions. So that's what this statement is saying. The set of functions is linearly independent on the interval if no function is a linear combination of the other functions, okay? Now, normally when we look at functions, we can tell whether it's dependent or independent. But sometimes you have more complicated functions like exponential functions or logarithmic functions or trigonometric functions. And in those cases, it may be a little bit harder to look at it and determine whether or not they can be written as linear combinations of one another. Therefore, there's a, a faster way or a better way to determine whether or not a set of functions is linearly independent or not, okay? This method requires us to use what's called a Ron scheme. Now, in order for me to uh, use the Ron scheme, I have to actually give you the definition of it. So the definition 3.1.2 is. So it's, suppose you have a list of functions, f1, f2, f3, all the way to f whatever, however many you're given. Typically, we're given two or three. We don't usually worry about functions outside of two or three derivatives. Um, so it says the determinant w of this set here is called the Ron scheme. Now, what is this? This is your original functions, your original list of functions. Then you take its derivatives. Then you take its second derivative, its third derivative, so on and so forth, until you end up with the square matrix, okay? So that's the process for the Ron scheme. Now, and then you just determine the uh, determinant of it, okay? Now typically in our problems, we usually have, um, a second order DE, which will give us two, um, functions that could possibly be solutions, or we may end up with a, um, the DE of order three, and if we have a DE of order three, then we would have three um, functions as our solutions, okay? But normally, 
we don't deal with anything beyond that. Now, of course, these are general theorems, so of course they go all the way to the nth, um, whatever number that may be. But we don't need to go that far. We usually go one, one to two or three functions, and that's it. Now, theorem 3.1.3 .3 says the functions f1, f2, f3, so on and so forth, are linear independent if and only if the Ron scheme does not equal zero for all x in the interval. This is important because if the Ron scheme, if this determinant is equal to zero for any x value whatsoever, all it takes is one x value to make the Ron scheme equal to zero, then the functions that you were given, the set of functions you were given, is not linearly independent, which means it would be linearly dependent, okay? So that's important to know. Now for our first example, um, they give us this problem here. So they say, determine whether the given set of functions is linearly dependent or linearly independent, okay? And so when we set this up, we had set it up as the list of functions f, x squared, and then 4x minus 3x squared. Now because we have three different terms, that automatically creates three different columns, which means if we want a square matrix, we have to have, still have three rows. Well, the first row would have to be the first derivative, or the first row is actually the originals the next row would be the first derivatives. So we would get one, two x, and four minus six x. Then the next row to create a square matrix would be zero, two, and negative six. Now, there is um, the way that you were taught in college algebra to find the determinant was to use what's called a minor axis. Now you could use a row, but because of this term here, I don't want to use a row. So I'm actually going to use a column as my minor axes, okay? What that means is I'm going to take the first term there and I'm gonna keep it positive. Then I'm gonna take the second term and I'm gonna change its sign and I'm gonna keep the third term and keep that guy's sign, okay? So if these guys were negative, if all three of them were negative, this would be the same sign, negative x, this would be the opposite sign, positive one, and this would be the same sign, whatever it is, okay? So you use these in that order. Same sign, opposite sign, same sign, always. Then the next thing you need to do is create a determinant for each one. So here, my axis is x. So I'm going to imagine that this row that the x lives in and this column that the x lives in is gone. And so what I have left is 2x, 2, 4 minus 6x, and negative 6. Now I move on to the 1 as my axis. Yes, we already determined that this should be the opposite sign, but I still need to fill in this determinant. So if I take out that row and that column, what I end up with are these four terms there. So x squared, 4x minus 3x squared, 2 and negative 6. For the last one, it really doesn't matter because 0 times anything is going to be 0, but we'll set it up just the same. So take out this row and this column. We end up with x squared, 2x, 4x minus 3x squared, and 4 minus 6x. And then now we determine the, um, the determinants here. So we get x times, 2x times negative 6 is negative 12x minus 2 times 4 minus 6x. I get a negative 1, and then I cross this way, that's negative 6x squared minus two times this. I'll leave the distributing for the next step. And here you would get zero 
times the determinant of this, x squared 4 minus 6x minus these guys multiplied 2x, 4x minus 3x squared. However, because it's 0 times all this, this term really doesn't make a difference. It's all just going to go away and become a big fat 0. But for the rest of the expression, I do need to distribute and work from the inner parentheses outward. So we end up with x times negative 8, which is negative 8x, negative 1 times negative 8x, which is positive 8x, which means I end up with 0, okay? So based on the definition of linearly um, independence, uh, theorem 3.1.3, if I get 0, I actually got 0 for all x, because 0 always equals 0, no matter what x is. Um, that means that this is going to be linearly dependent, okay? However, this is a lot of work to calculate a Ron scheme. So what I've done is I've done a quicker way um, for 3 by 3 matrix, okay? So for a 2 by 2, it's very easy. You multiply this way, and then you subtract the result you get when you multiply the other way. However, when you apply a 3 by 3 matrix, you can do a method very similar to it. The only thing is, is that you have to repeat the first two rows outside the determinant bars, okay? Once you do that, you do the same steps as you did before, except you have three by three, which means you need three diagonal pieces to make one fact, one term. So x times 2x times negative 6 gives me negative 12x squared. Then we move on to the next. x squared times 4 minus 6x times 0. It doesn't matter what this product is, because when I multiply by 0, I just get 0. Then 4x minus 3x squared times 1 times 2. I went ahead and multiplied the binomials, the, I'm sorry, the monomials together and saved the binomial for the distribution later. Okay? Now we go the other direction, but remember in a 2 by 2, when we go the other direction, we subtract that product. So when I do 0 times 2x times 4x minus 3x squared, I will eventually get 0, but notice how I put minus 0. Then here I'm going to have 2 times 4 times x, or I'm sorry, 2 times 4 minus 6x times x. Again, I multiplied the monomials and saved the binomial for the distribution later. Okay, but I did subtract this product. Then here we have negative 6 times 1 times x squared. So I subtract the product, and the product is negative 6x squared. So now I'm going to do my distribution and my signs. So this is negative 12x squared, plus 0 is not going to do anything. If I distribute positive 2, I end up with positive 8x minus 6x squared. Minus 0, it's gone. Negative 2x times 4 is negative 8x. Negative 2x times negative 6x is positive 12x squared. And then negative times a negative 6x squared is positive 6x squared. So these two terms cancel. A negative 12x squared, a positive 12x squared. These two terms cancel. Positive 8x, negative 8x. And these two terms cancel. Negative 6x squared, positive 6x squared. So we end up with 0. Again, it doesn't matter what x was because all the x's canceled. So no matter what, my Ron scheme is always going to equal 0, which means it's definitely linearly dependent. Okay? Now we're going to try the same thing with example 2. But in example 2, we have two functions only. So the problem here is that the absolute value bar, you really have to consider two different cases. What happens when x is positive and 0, and what happens when x is less than 0? So when x is positive, no matter what I plug in here, I'm going to get that same exact thing out. So my f2 becomes 2 plus exactly what I plugged into the bars, okay? Whereas if my x value is negative, what comes out of the bars is actually going to turn positive. It's going to be the opposite sign of what I plugged in. 
So for instance, if I plug in a negative 5, I'm going to actually get a positive 5 back. So if I were to plug in a negative 5 here, I'd actually end up with 2 positive 5, so 2 plus 5, okay? So now when I do go to compute my Ron schemes, these two happen to be the same, so when I take the derivative, I get 1. These two are slightly different. When I take the first derivative, I get 1 and negative 1. Here, when I multiply these, I get two, min 2 plus x. When I multiply these, I also get 2 plus x, but I have to subtract, which means I'm going to end up getting 0. Over here, when I multiply this times this, I get negative 2 and negative x minus 1 times that, which is just 2 minus x. So if you distribute your negative, you end up with negative 2 plus x. Now the x's go away, but you end up with negative 4. Now, the, what this means is that the Ronskine always equals negative 4 for x less than 0. However, the Ronskine equals 0 when x is greater than or equal to 0. And all it takes is one x value to give you a Ronskine of 0, and the whole thing is linearly dependent. And since I got 0 for half of the x values, right, if you're talking about a number line, from negative infinity to zero is pretty much half the number line, you're gonna get linearly dependent, okay? So it doesn't matter that this one is never zero because this one is zero for some of your x values. Okay. So for num example three, we have verify the given functions from the fundamental set of solutions of the DE on an indicated interval. So all we want to do is verify that these two functions will form a fundamental set of solutions, which means a linear combination of these two. I can only write the general solution as a linear combination of these two if these two are linearly independent. So the first thing I need to do is actually verify whether those two functions are linearly independent. If they are, then I can write my fundamental set of solutions as a linear combination of these two functions. Okay? So what I did was I set up the Ron scheme. So we have our functions e to the 3x, e to the power 4x. The derivative of this function is negative 3 negative 3x by chain rule. The derivative of this function is 4e to the 4x. So then I did my determinant. This term times this term. So whether you put these in the front or the back, it doesn't matter, but e to the negative 3x times 4e to the 4x minus the product here. So e to the 4x times negative 3e to the negative 3x. Well, here your coefficient is going to be 4. And when you have two things with the same base being multiplied together, you actually add their exponents. So 4x plus a negative 3x is actually a positive 1x. Here I'm going to have negative times a negative 3, so I end up with positive e. Again, these are multiplied, so add their exponents, I get a positive 1 exponent, positive 1x one exponent. And these two are actually like terms, so we combine them into one term, 7e to the x. However, if you graph 7e to the x, it looks like this. And because of the horizontal asymptote here, it will never equal 0, which means that this function never equals 0 for any x. And that's exactly the criteria we needed to be labeled as linearly independent. And because it's linearly independent, our fundamental set of solutions would be written in this manner y equals some constant times the first function plus some other constant times the second function. So we're just verifying whether these could be written in this way. And they can only be written in that way if these guys are linearly independent. Okay? If they were linearly dependent, then I wouldn't need to write the second one. This would be all I need because the other one's just a multiple of the first. Okay? But in our case, it's not the situation. Okay, so we do have to use both when we're writing the general solution. Now here's the homework set for this section. For 3.1.2, we've got 
numbers 16, 17, 19, 25, and 29. So be sure to try to attempt those particular problems.